Hello everyone, it's uh, National Science Week and we are gathered here today for a wonderful uh, presentation, The Science of Nest Boxes, organised by uh, Libby Hepburn and the Atlas of Life as part of the Sapphire Coast Science Festival. Um, I just have to um, uh, quickly say that, uh, you know, we're here on um, well, I'm here on Duringanj land in uh, um, Bourne National Park on the far south coast, part of the Ewan Nation. And I know our presenters are uh, spread out in various locations, but um, we, we do want to acknowledge the traditional custodians, uh, to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging, and to extend those acknowledgements to any Aboriginal persons present uh, today. And uh, it's an important part of all of the activities that we've done this week to, to make that acknowledgement at the start of every activity. I do also uh, have to mention that, um, I don't have to mention it, but our sponsors are Inspiring New South Wales, uh, Inspiring Australia New South Wales. Jackie Randall's the manager is based at uh, Sydney University and uh, the, um, the, the Inspiring New South Wales, Australia New South Wales Science Hub model is all about connecting up uh, community with scientists, people using science in their everyday life. Of course, during Science Week, celebrating that. Now, um, I just bring everyone's attention to the fact that we have a Q&A button for the participants uh, out there, the attendees. Uh, we would like questions, of course, that's a big part of today. You see, uh, hear lots of wonderful information and we'd like to see um, your questions popping up in Q&A. You can also address questions directly to the host and panellists um, uh, via the chat. And if there's any issue that you want to raise, please use those two um, uh, channels to, to let us know what you're thinking. So that, that's it for me. I'm now going to hand over to Annie, Annie, um, Annie Lane. I forgot your last name for a second there, Annie. Annie Lane, who is our moderator for today. So thank you, Annie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on nest boxes, um, which follows on really well from the couple of sessions we had yesterday on the glossy blacks and the gang gang. Um, so we're, we're fortunate today to have two fantastic speakers who have quite a lot of experience around this area of nest boxes. Um, we'll be starting with uh, Courtney Finkdowns. Uh, Courtney is a Natural Resources Officer from Yoruba Dunlashire Council, and she works across a range of natural resource matters, including uh, management of domestic cats, uh, uh, community gardens and invasive species, and in particularly nest boxes, uh, our topic of interest today. And she works a lot with uh, landholders and, and others in installing nest boxes and and this is particularly uh, poignant after the fires, of course. And um, across the Shire, there have many 500 nest boxes that uh, have been installed, which is a fantastic effort. Um, Courtney will then hand over to Dr. Susan Ryan, who is a wildlife ecologist, uh, biologist, and um, she has extensive experience in researching around uh, the effectiveness, I guess, and the pitfalls of, of nest boxes. Indeed, she did her. PhD study uh, using nest boxes uh, for brush-tailed fasca gales. Uh, along with her partner, Murray Ellis, partner in life and research partner, uh, they have you know, done a lot of work on, on nest boxes. Um, and Murray's also, also done some innovative stuff around uh, looking at hollow entrance and entrances in trees. Uh, so, um, we touched on a topic yesterday in the gang gangs about um, overheating in hollows, and that's also been an area of research for Susan and Murray. So with that, I'll hand over to Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Um, just to put our nesting box project into context, so I'm based in Yerubad Shire. So we're about four and a half hours south of Sydney and a couple hours east of Canberra. And our uh, Shire area was impacted significantly by the bushfires with about 80% of our Shire being bushfire impacted. So a huge amount of our bushland 
um, was subject to the fires. Uh, prior to the fires, though, we had held a number of workshops um, with Susan and Murray guiding us, and there was a huge amount of community interest in nesting boxes. Those workshops were more tailored at uh, backyard habitat and encouraging people to have bush-friendly gardens and it tied with, in with so many of our other programs. But the 1920 bushfires, as I said, a huge amount of the Shire um, was bushfire impacted. Um, and in many of those situations, the fires were so intense that it didn't actually create um, more hollows. It actually just got rid of the hollows. So we um, have seen a reduction in many areas of actually having hollows. Um, and I just want to also reiterate that obviously the natural hollows are far more important um, and beneficial to have if we can maintain them, but there may be some instances where nesting boxes are required. And for us, because we had lost um, so, so much of the bush was impacted by fire and we had lost um, quite a lot of hollows, that we actually commenced our nesting box program. And that all came about because a couple of days after the bushfires, I actually called a lot of the VWIRES volunteers to come and sit on my kitchen floor or lantern floor rather, and to brainstorm as to what we could do to help our wildlife here. Um, I wasn't even able to offer them a cup of tea. I didn't even have power to be a nice host, but uh, they still continued to work with me. Um, and so from that, we then um, commenced a nesting box program. And for us, we were able to get funding from WISE. And then we were fortunate that many groups across the country actually donated nesting boxes to us. So we had four wheel drive clubs driving um, trailer loads of nesting boxes from all over the country. Um, even myself, where I grew up in Victoria, the men shed made lots of nesting boxes and I was fortunate that the various airlines that I was able to fly with were more than happy to actually let me bring them as luggage. I didn't have many clothes or anything to bring. It was just nesting boxes. Um, and also to some of the big uh, freight companies across the country also donated their resources to be able to bring nesting boxes to us. So from that, we ended up with about 500 nesting boxes that were donated, um, a whole mix of different nesting boxes, different styles of which we had to adapt um, to be more tailored to, to here. And we worked with Susan and Murray um, to make that all happen. Um, for us, we have a range of different nesting boxes, which are more generalist species, if you like. And Susan, no doubt, will go through the specific um, nesting boxes. But from that, um, I actually worked with a lot of landholders in assisting them to install nesting boxes. So initially we tried to focus on the areas that either weren't bushfire impacted, which was a bit tricky, or in the zones where there was some intact bush and in the areas where they're on that, that fringe. So for us, we've got nesting boxes scattered throughout the entire Shire. Um, and where all those nesting boxes are, we have them really, really well recorded. We have a fantastic database, again, working with Susan and Murray to capture a lot of information. So for us, we know not only where the nesting boxes are, but we also know how high they're located, the aspect, um, you know, how high up the tree. We also know a lot of detail about individual nesting boxes. So every nesting box has their unique number and from that, we know the actual dimensions of the box, the thickness of the plywood, the entrance hole size, the materials that they're made out of, the color of the nesting box, and so many things. So prior to embarking on this project, um, I didn't realize um, how much I was involved with nesting boxes. And we've been really, really fortunate to have the assistance of Susan and Murray to guide us through this whole process as well. Um, so now with having those nesting boxes up on private property, some on council reserves, but we've also got them in our schools. So for our schools and for our children, it's been a really good way for them to be able to connect, if you like, with nature and wildlife and to see that we actually have been able to help nature in recovering from the bushfires. So for a lot of those school students to go out with their binoculars and see the rainbow lorikeets coming out of the boxes has been really, really important, more so than probably ever before. Um, so following the nesting boxes being installed, and I should also mention that a lot of people have been able to install them themselves because they have the species that we have the nesting boxes for haven't required to be up very high. 
So they've actually been able to install them by climbing ladders. And no doubt Susan will go through various heights in a minute. Um, there have also been circumstances where people haven't felt comfortable in doing that. So we've been fortunate to be able to engage contractors to actually climb trees and install nesting boxes. So we have been able to give them the nesting boxes to those particular companies and they have been able to go out far and wide to install them um, for us and, and on behalf of those private property owners as well. We have commenced some monitoring and have some wonderful photos of people uh, have taken of a creatures, critters actually using those nesting boxes. And we actually have got a pole camera. It was meant to be delivered some time ago, but it's actually coming as we speak. Um, so we can start to work with the community when we can get out and about, and they can actually undertake some citizen science monitoring of those nesting boxes. So we're hoping we have a really good overview of what are using those nesting boxes in fact, are they even being used? Um, and this will all be as part of our database and should have a really good um, understanding of what is actually happening. And again, guided by Susan and Murray, and I keep saying their names. So yes, they're, they're great and been valuable with everything we've done. Um, and finally, following that, we've also recently applied for a, a, a funding for the gang gang specific nesting tubes, which are hopeful we will also receive the funding for which then will actually be a, a um, bird specific program, but it really just complements what we have been doing. And a lot of those property owners have already been recording the location and presence absence of gang gangs to assist potentially with the project as well. So that's a little overview of the program we have had here running since the fires um, on the New South Wales South Coast. And I think I might hand over to Susan because she's just a wealth of knowledge with all the details um, of the nesting boxes. So it's over to you, Susan. Thanks, Courtney. And hit share my screen. It worked, Doug. Yay. <laughs> can you hear me all right? We can okay. hear you loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. everybody. It's lovely to be here. I've got a PowerPoint presentation that a whole pile of people saw last week. I think some are watching again, so you can check out whether I'm being consistent. Look, it's a whirlwind tour of nest boxes. It's the sort of thing that people ask me about and things that I think are important. So I'll just get straight underway. Um, I'm presenting, but this is work that I've done with Murray. And I'd also really like to acknowledge Narrow and Williams, who I've learned a lot from as well. Yeah. This is not wanting to go. Here we go. Um, so in the 1990s, Doug, am I able to remove that um, thing at the top? It's actually blocking out the- You can the, move it, oh, I'm sorry. I can move it around. You can move now. it around. Yeah, you can just slide it as long as you don't. Um... Oh, there we go. Yep. All right. Um, so my work began in the 1990s. So I've been at this for a whole part of time. There I am on the left building nest boxes, you know, wooden box, um, bang them up and hope for the best. That's what you did then. People didn't really um, examine whether they were working or not. Fortunately, they were for me. Um, and this is the critter that I studied for years and years, and they love nest boxes. We'll come back to the brush-tailed Fascagal shortly. Um, meanwhile, Murray's work with boxes actually started in about 2013. He and I had both worked a lot on natural hollows, but in 2013, the Warren Bungles National Park lost about 80, doesn't sound familiar, 80% of its forest. And one of the responses was, it sounds familiar, was to put up about 600 nest boxes because of loss of hollows. But a ranger noticed a um, squirrel glider bailing out at two in the afternoon. People noticed that some of the boxes were very exposed to the sun and um, some of them weren't being used. So Murray started doing experimentation, checking out whether the size of boxes affects their temperature. The question was, really, we think they're getting too hot. So that's where his work began. And he was also with his colleague, Jenny Taylor, who's in the bottom right there, uh, testing uh, the temperatures inside natural hollows and in the middle there in caves, testing for bats and testing on the top right. Um, 
actually inside the nest boxes. So gathering, starting to gather lots of data. And other researchers were also starting to question about uh, how good the nest boxes were. I'm just going to turn my video off so I don't have to look at myself. That's better. Um, in 2016, we started some experimental work uh, that's testing the temperature of nest boxes just out in the full sun. It just makes it easier to standardise things. And we had temperature uh, probes inside them. And we started testing different designs of boxes. And there's the temperature logger there. And we um, ended up putting them up in trees in a particular study, which I'll talk about later. So this is some of the work that was being done. Um, as Courtney mentioned, we were also helping the Eurobadala with their nest box workshops. There's 2019 and there's some COVID safe work in 2020 painting nest boxes. The first question people ask is, are nest boxes as good as natural hollows? And the answer is absolutely not. The reason is that um, natural hollows have really thick walls and nest boxes are limited by having thin walls because otherwise they're too heavy to put up. This is wooden boxes. This is something that people didn't appreciate till recently. The sap movement in the tree um, actually cools in the tree. So the inside where the hollow is, is actually really quite cool. The trees, of course, last for hundreds of years, whereas nest boxes may be a good nest box, maybe 25 years. And, and the old trees that hollows in are also a, a source of food for the animals. So they have other roles. And oh, this is just some wonderful work on koalas. So this is a koala hugging the tree. And this is a thermal image showing how cool the tree, so cool is blue, the tree is compared to the koalas. And the koalas are actually using the tree to cool off. Koalas are very heat sensitive. Um, next question is, are nest boxes useful and used by animals? Well, the answer is yes and no. And I'm going to talk about mammals because that's really my area rather than, we'll talk about birds a little bit, but mammals I know best. Some animals really like nest boxes. So the small gliders, the sugar gliders, um, possums and fasca gales really like nest boxes. Some animals are very fussy. Yes, they like nest boxes, but they have to be just right. And some species re rarely ever use them. And this is your greater gliders and yellow belly gliders. And some will use them, but when it comes to raising young, they're very fussy. So of the species, and I'm talking south coast here, far south coast, um, the big mammals that um, we'll use um, that we're talking about here are the greater gliders and yellow belly gliders. Very little success getting them to use boxes. Brush tail possums and ring tail possums, they like boxes. The medium species are the squirrel glider. Ooh. The squirrel glider and sugar glider and the fasca gale. So all those animals I've been talking about are types of possums. The brush-tailed fasca gale is a dasyurid, it's carnivorous, related to quolls and antichinus. And then we've got the little ones, the feather-tailed gliders, the um, antichinus, the gorgeous pygmy possum on the right there and the little feather-tailed glider. Oh, and the microbats, sorry. I'll come back to bats in a second. So that, that's just the most beautiful picture in the entire world. That's a pygmy possum. And of course, there, there's a whole pile of microbats that also use cavities and hollows. And then there's all the birds and reptiles. So in total, we have about 300 species in, in uh, Australia that use hollows and about 114 species of birds um, use hollows. And so here in, in East in Eastern Australia, we've got about 87 species of birds and about 30 odd reptiles. You can see that in the bottom right, there's an owl at night to sharing with a frog. So there's a lot of species that need hollows. Have there been successful programs? Absolutely. Um, in Europe, they've been doing nest box programs for a very long time and they've been doing lots of monitoring. This is mostly with birds. And um, they have managed to um, get really good breeding programs going, all sorts of things. In Australia here, um, I found that when I was doing research on fasca gales and other people have done work on this species too, up to 95% of my boxes would be used by fasca gales. Um, little gliders, they love boxes too. Uh, lead beaters possums, they really like nest boxes. 75% of nest boxes targeted for those were used by them. 
feather tail gliders also like block boxes and pygmy possums. So there are a range of species that do like them. So uh, yes, they can be successful for those species. How do you make nest boxes attractive? Well, look, this is a, this is a really big area because there's so many different species needing so many different things. So I'm just talking generally here. Um, the box has to be the right size cavity for the species. The entrance size is absolutely critical. critical. I would say that it's probably one of the most important things. And they need to have good insulation properties. A problem in Australia is our boxes get too hot. So our, our mammals are nocturnal. So they're asleep in the box during the day. So if that box is exposed, it can get way too hot. So they use hollows and nest boxes all year with the birds. The birds just use them um, during breeding. Um, so it's a different time of year, but the same problem. Any, any box that'll get above about 40 degrees is really problematic. So we'll talk about insulation in a second. Um, the box needs to be the right height up the tree. It needs to be in full shade because of that heat problem. And it needs to be placed in relationship to the landscape. Now, if you talk to, uh, by this, I mean, if you want something that glides to use a box, it has to be within gliding range of another tree. If it's um, uh, something that can fly a bird, it can be much further away. Um, if you talk to some scientists like uh, Professor David Lindenmeyer, he will say that um, boxes are not very useful because he used them in, in different environments. So on the coast, they're useful. The further you go inland and into some other forests, they may not be as useful. So I'm mostly talking about the coast here. Uh, the attachment needs to last and not damage the tree. You don't want to ring bark the tree. And some species have very exact requirements in terms of the box. Oh, and I wanted to tell you, this is the most marvellous story. I only found out about it recently. This is Dr. Campbell's back tower. So research on, on nest boxes is not unique. Uh, to now. Uh, so this is 1990s in the USA, these horrible swampy areas full of malaria. So he figured that bats eat mosquitoes, let's make this amazing bat roost. And you can see how enormous it is. He made it, the bats didn't stay. So he went and studied bats and he came up with a new plan. Uh, the tower needs to be near water. So he actually put it near a water source where the bats could drink and it was very successful. And this more to this story about using brass bands to scare bats to go into it and things like that, which ultimately his work resulted in the eradication of malaria. And that was due to him applying his observations on bats. And I can't see what I wrote there. Oh, yes. Um, it became against the law to kill micro bats because of this, because of their role in malaria. It's a, it's a great bit of research 100 years ago. Um, there's current lots of current research going on uh, with regard to bats. And I'm going to make available after the talk some references for those who are interested, but there's some recent stuff about the effects of the material and the color and the size of the box on whether bats like them. Common problems with boxes. The wrong species uses it. I think this is funny. They, it's not wrong to them. It's very hard to say, you know, crimson rosellas only. Um, if an animal can fit inside a box and likes boxes, it will get in there. Uh, the box doesn't get used. That's a common problem. Uh, the box doesn't last long, and that's about con poor construction. And predators can get in. So we've got, you know, goannas and, unfortunately, cats, or they sit on top and wait. Um, and you can see all this chewing here. And what I'm showing you there on the top right is um, a way of avoiding chewing is to put a hardwood plate We've put a hardwood plate over some softwood there because that's very hard for the cockatoos to chew and the possums to chew. I won't, I'll, I'll just skip over this one because I'm, I've made this available later for you. And I've made the preferred ways of attaching available to you too. The one thing I'd say is have two types of attachment in case one fails and don't ring bark the tree. So you can see if you look on the bottom right, you can see the bendy wire, which can expand as the tree grows, has a hose around the back. There are lots and lots of different designs. These are all various wooden boxes. Uh, not all boxes are put up for conservation. This one is a very recent bit of publication from South Australia, fantastic work on barn owls. So this is a box on a pole 
and uh, they worked very hard to get exactly the right design of box. And the reason they did this was because they had a mouse plague. It was very successful. And if you're interested in making barn owl nest boxes, they're very specific, but there's a really great video from England on um, the, available on the internet. And I've made that publication from South Australia available as well. And here's one on a pole on our property. Um, this is for ducks that like to, um, when the little ducklings jump out, they like to go into water. The advantage of having a nest box on a pole, it's fly in, fly out. The predators find it very hard to get in. Not all, not all um, nest boxes are made of wood. This is a PVC one uh, that's made for powder loads. So I wanted to come to the current stuff that we are doing, but this also um, shows you different styles of boxes. Not all boxes are wooden. And for glossy black cockatoos and for some others, big PVC pipes are used. And Murray and I started experimenting with designs last year. We based it on some very successful work that was is being done in WA and Kangaroo Island for Glossy Blacks. And um, the, the nest box for these needs to be very specific and it's not something you'd want to take on because in, in a wooden box, an animal can always beak its way out or claw its way out. With these, because they're PVC, you could entrap the animal if you didn't do it properly. So you really need to have the good design. And um, there's some very specific things. Can you see the chewing post, the uh, bottom left? You can see a chewing post. You have to have a chewing post in there so that they can make their wood, wood chips. Apparently, if you don't have a chewing post in it, they the glossy blacks will not, or the black cockatoos will not use the, the nest box. Um, on the bottom right, you can see it needs a very specific ladder for the chick and the adults to get out, things like that. So based on the information about the glossy black, We've come up with a design for gang gangs with the help of all the data that um, Michael Mulvaney and Laura Rayner, the, the ACT people working on gang gangs, if you listened to that talk yesterday, they provided to us. So we used the combination of the information about glossy blacks plus the um, Canberra data to make artificial nest hollows for gang gangs. And last year we put those up. As I said, don't try this at home because we really need to test that this design is safe for the birds as well as we'd like them to use it, of course. So this is uh, Laura Rayner, a colleague in ACT Parks who, who's worked extensively on parrots and is involved in the ACT Gang Gang project. And she's putting these up in the trees for us. This is another reason you don't want to try it at home. You can see Laura up the tree and the box being hauled up, the, the nest tube being hauled up. And this is obviously going to be a monitoring challenge, which we will be up for. Um, we will have been doing some other nest box work with Courtney and uh, set up a lovely project with Courtney, Carroll College in Browley. Um, the students made boxes for us. Uh, they used um, a new design that we had come up with. And the new design was, this isn't new, the rear entry but this is the double walled air gap to keep the boxes cool. And we have just published, we, we are just publishing that work. And so we, with uh, Courtney's help, we built these nest boxes and we put them up trees and we put cameras on them. Here you go, here's the rear entry. I love rear entry boxes because the animals climb up the gap along the back of the tree and they can get in that way. So it means that predators can't get in, bees can't get in, and it also prevents birds using the box. So this is really great for mammals. And here are some of our camera results. So this is a little antichinus going into one of those boxes. That's a sugar tail glider tail. There's a little antichinus sitting out in the middle of the day. There's a sugar glider thinking about it. That's a, a white-throated tree creeper. Unfortunately, we lost a lot in the fires. So not to be deterred, with um, Courtney and some of the nest boxes that came to them, we have established lots of nest boxes on our properties, which we're monitoring temperatures in and we're monitoring use of. And I'm just about at the end of this and I'm going to share some photos with you 
of our findings. Oh, just have to, one sec, I just have to move this. I can't see my comments. Oh, yes. Um, the height of nest boxes, people ask about this all the time. Nest boxes don't really need to be that high. It, it depends a little bit, but they don't really need to be that high. The reason they're put up really high is, is mostly to stop vandalism. Um, if, the, if you're putting them on your property and your property's safe, then two to three metres, you know, the top of the where you can get to with the ladder is fine. Um, I, I like to always put them in amongst branches, so it does depend on what sort of trees you've got. And you saw those gang gang ones we put up very high. So here's some pictures of what's going on. We have had squirrel gliders go into our boxes. Uh, there's a little feather-tailed glider. And we've had lot, lots of activity. Um, Brush-tailed possums happily moving in. Uh, Brush-tailed possums happily trying to move in to ones that weren't designed for them. Here's this one. I'll just click through this. Working its way. It's exhausted. You can see it spent hours and hours chewing on that. And not happy with that, it recruited some help. So this is where that hardwood plate's very helpful. Ringtail possums. And what you can see is this ringtail's really squeezing, squeezing out hard. Um, I mentioned before the entrance is really important. Animals want to get in the tightest hollow they can fit in. So they go in and nothing bigger than them follows them. So this is for, you know, keep predators and competitors out. And ringtail possums have a bit of problem with brushtail possums, which are a bit bigger. So they like tight hollows if they can get them. And you look at look at these next couple of pictures, really squeezy. <laughs> but it used that all the time. Happy ringtail. Um, and this is from about four weeks ago, these pictures, these couple of uh, sugar gliders. And they're madly nest building at the moment. Everything's getting ready for breeding. And you can see they've got uh, all the nesting material in their tail. And antichinus, they're packing leaves into their nest boxes. You can see this one taking its leaves in. The other thing that's really nice about the photos is you can actually get a lot of behavioural stuff. And we have an idea of how many animals are using boxes at the same time. So breeding and things like that. So these are a couple of the sugar gliders. Uh, two ringtails been hanging out together. And I just like this photo. I think it's funny. Brush tail bottom. So there's just a couple of pictures, but all of our, we've got about 15 nest boxes and then a variety of nest tubes. And I think 14 of our 15 have been regularly used. And they've been up for 18 months and they would have been used within a couple of months. Um, so our cameras are on at night to detect uh, mammal activity. But we are now watching just at lunchtime or when we're having a cuppa, we're watching our boxes during the day and we're seeing a lot of bird activity. And these are some galahs trying to enlarge the hole of this particular nest box. That, that photo was taken one week ago. Okay, I've only got a couple of slides to go and I just wanted to introduce some um, novel work that's been doing, doing <laughs> novel work that is being done. Um, Murray has been doing some um, hollow uh, work making entrances into trees because it takes a very, very long time for a tree to develop an entrance. We don't have woodpeckers in Australia to do that job. And he's been drilling holes into trees and monitoring them. This is in the Warren Bungles, also here and also on the far south coast near Bunga and um, making entrances into trees and he has so far detected 26 species exploring or using hollows that have had entrances made into them. Another type of alternative to nest boxes that you might hear in the media quite a bit is about chainsaw hollows. And this is where a, a hollow is actually dug out with a chainsaw, chopped out with a chainsaw, and then the face place is put back on. Um, this, of course, is, you know, you need an arborist and, and uh, chainsawing up a tree is pretty hazardous. This is also potentially hazardous to the tree, but um, the researchers are getting better and better at this. So you might have heard about that. Future work, you, uh, based on what you would have heard yesterday from Miles, there's a whole lot of gang gang work that's going to be going on here if our 
funding comes through and that's going to be run by the Yoruba Dalla Shire Council by Courtney and um, Murray and I are going to help with that work. And that's going to be uh, testing whether our nest tubes are useful to this species. And I'm going to get back to uh, looking at uh, brush-tailed fast gales. We thought that they were extinct on the far south coast, but there have been some sightings. So I want to look at that a little more. And thank you all very much for listening. I know that was a bit rushed. Oh, thanks so much, Susan. That was really fantastic. Thanks for sharing your stunning photos and your quirky little stories and, uh, and, and some of the resources also that you provided links to. Um, I just wondered if you would touch on the insulation question, given that the overheating is such a big problem, particularly in burnt areas. So could you talk about any, any tips to um, address that particular challenge? Um, the, we've come up with a design of nest box that you can retrofit to an existing box. And it's actually a double wall, just like your house might have two walls with an air gap between. So you might have a, um, say it's a burnt area and you're going to put a box out in an exposed um, aspect because you have no choice. Uh, you can make, add, add shielding walls to it. You can give it a roof, have an air gap under the roof and it doesn't add much weight. So you can whip the box down, attach some extra walls and a roof and put it back up. And our work shows that in sun, a double walled box is about 10 degrees cooler than an ordinary plain wooden box. Mm. Also, um, if you paint a box in dark colours, it's much hotter than if it's in pale colours. So we did things like paint them white. Now, most people don't want white nest boxes because they stick out a bit. But if you paint it in a very pale green or something like that, it's much better than having a dark green. So you can knock off a degree or two doing it that way. But the best thing is to give it some shade and if you, mm. if you so move it on another side of the tree, look at where the afternoon sun is and put the box in the best position possible. And if maybe just one side of it gets a blast of sun in the afternoon, you could put a second wall just on that one side. It really will make a difference. Okay, thank you. Um, now, before we get to questions, and I think there are a few, I'd like to welcome Andrew Morrison, who is an environmental officer with the Bigger Valley Shire Council, and he has a background in monitoring threatened species. So Andrew, what's happening on the on the Bega Valley in terms of nest boxes? Yeah, thanks Annie and uh, thanks Susan. That was fantastic, very informative and I'll be super quick because I'm sure there'll be heaps of questions. Um, I think uh, I'll just give a very brief Thank overview. Um, we've done uh, quite a bit of work in Bega Valley um, through a whole range of different scenarios in terms of getting nest boxes into the environment. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a range of private landholder nest boxes. We've got um, environmental groups, land care groups that have got grants through council and through other means. Um, development offsets where we get uh, the, the developer to put up nest boxes to, to sort of compensate for loss of habitat. Um, and some uh, Bega Valley Shire Council specific projects. Um, one of the issues we've got is that all of those different projects uh, have the potential to get data together into a publicly accessible accessible spot. Um, so I'm going to be working with Susan and Courtney um, and the Atlas of Life to try and get a, a nature, uh, sorry, an eye naturalist project um, so that people can record the animals that are coming in and out of their nest boxes um, and some of the details of the nest boxes themselves in a, in a um, publicly available space that's easy to, to collect that data and can be used for um, management decisions or assessing development and that sort of thing. So very useful data. Um, I'll just very quickly show uh, one of the projects we've been working on down here in Bega. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, okay, so this, just bear with me. This is a, um, a nest box that we've been uh, sort of piloting for pygmy possums. Um, it's a, a species that I've got a real interest in. Um, they very hard to survey, but they will, uh, as, as Susan said, take to nest boxes quite readily. Um, so we've been 
giving some out to some of the land care groups so they can take on a, a, an extra dimension to their land care work and check the boxes. They can be installed very low, so you can you don't need any special gear to to look into them. Um, we'd expect to get a range of species, uh, as Susan had said, um, antichinus, feather tail gliders, and the eastern pygmy possum down in that um, bottom corner there. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll keep that work going, and I'll be looking. I'm sort of all enthused after this session to to get back onto that project. Um, just while while we're here, I've got uh, uh, an example of feather tail gliders. Um, this is a dog poo dispenser box um, near one of our beaches, and uh, we went and checked that out, and it had a, a feather tail glider. Uh, family nesting in it so we, we relocated it into the bush but it just shows um, how versatile you know they will be and in, in, in taking up any anything that we have to offer uh, I might leave it there for questions but um, yeah happy to if you contact Bega Valley Shire um, happy to answer any questions or um, yeah provide provide boxes we've got quite a few boxes um, in the wings so Zoe, you've got some ready-made ones there too in the dog uh, bag dispensers. Just yeah. whack, whack a bit of insulation in and away you go. That's right. Okay. Uh, Doug, are you monitoring questions or should I do that? I um, am keeping an eye on them. There's so many questions and uh, we've got about eight minutes. Um, so we'll just go with reading them out because it takes less time than going to the people that asked them. But um, Susan, there's a question here from Jess Bettinen, who's the Far South Coast Land Care Coordinator um, down here in the Bega Valley. Hi, Susan, are these monitoring images taken with a regular motion sensor camera or with the pole mounted camera? Um, they're taken with a Reconyx um, camera. That's a, a camera trap camera. It's, mon uh, it's, um, it's in fixing place. Thank you very much. And uh, Lexi has a question, Lexi Mayer. So would you um, suggest we use trail cameras on each box to monitor for, for how long? Um, trail cameras tend to be, tend to be the go. Uh, just if you are using it for nighttime work, just make sure that they have the capacity to be working in the far infrared range so that they, um, when, when they go off, they don't disturb the animals. Thank you very much. And uh, Alison Rodway, uh, Ali is the um, coordinator of the Far South Coast Conservation Management Network, which does fabulous work uh, around the place. And many of you would have um, been to some of their activities. Uh, Ali says, can anyone recommend research on how far apart to locate boxes for different species? Hello, Alison, lovely that you're here. Um, I know it for my species. I I'm not sure about others. Uh, M Murray Ellis is here with me. Any ideas, Murray? Oh, it's extremely variable. So things like the gang gangs they're talking about, they like to nest in clusters. clusters. So multiple nest boxes spaced 50 metres apart. But for other work, it's not only how far apart the boxes are, where you place them can be a problem. Uh, Squirrel gliders, I think it was, up on the north coast, Ross Golding Day. They put nest boxes too close to the rope uh, arrangements going across roads. And when a squirrel glider took up residence in the box at the end of the rope, nobody else was allowed to cross that bridge. <laughs> so there's matters of putting it in the landscape so animals can avoid each other. So don't put them at constrained, constricted parts of the landscape. But unfortunately, the rest of it, you you really need to just go by the home range size of each species and uh, plonk a couple out per territory size. And Thanks, Mark. I, and I, just to add to that, I think um, some knowledge of the behaviour of the species and how many, as individuals, how many, um, this is a behavioural question really, uh, how many hollows they like to use, say brush-tailed fascigals, they like to change hollows every few days. So an individual will need many, many boxes uh, but some species will, will sort of stay in the same ones for ages. I think it's species specific. Very good. Um, 
Look, there's so many questions and uh, I have to pull the plug in about five minutes, but we'll keep going. These are really good answers and any answers that, um, or questions that don't get answered, we'll um, put them to Susan and Courtney and um, we'll, uh, you know, see if we can send those answers to you because they're all good ones. Um, Ali, again, do any species like the boxes to be in sun during winter to keep them warm? If so, maybe we need boxes in a range of locations that is sunny and shady. Um with exclusion of bats, micro bats, I'd say the answer is no. Animals use behavioural ways to deal with being cold um, and the consequences of that box being in the sun. Um, it, it, overheating is the problem. That They have ways that they go into torpor or hibernate or they, they um, uh, buddy up for winter or they build nests. But they manage the cold fine. Um, bat, sorry, I want to say bats are ex exception. Bats are a bit crazy. They like to toast themselves at times. You know, you find them under tin and all sorts of things. But some bats can overheat as well. Bat, bat boxes are very specific. You have to decide what bat you're trying to attract and actually do some homework and make get that bat box right. Very good. Joel Poyet, um, where can we get the designs for double walling and the wire loop to hold it on the tree? Um, the I've given Doug some information on making nest boxes and and that's available to everyone. And, and at the end of that, there's some illustrations showing our design, but um, it's being formally published in Pacific Conservation Biology soonish. So it will be available. And once that becomes available, I think, Murray, we probably should um, actually just do an, an, a neat little um, guide how to, but it, it's pretty simple. Have, have, a look, a, have a look at that thing Doug sends around and see if that's got enough info for you. I, I have put those documents in chat, so people should be able to download them straight away. But if you can't, um, just let me know and I'll um, send them to you. And um, I'm sure all the animals prefer, uh, prefer peer-reviewed designs. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> um, any thoughts on fixing the box to the tree with the screws as opposed to using the, fire, the wire loop? Um, I love using screws and nails in trees. Um, but some people really object to it. Uh, notably, foresters object to it because it's very bad for chainsaws. So the other thing is trees can um, spit out nails and screws. So uh, you, you've got to, but I, I, I use screws in trees all the time. So, so it's, a it's a matter of preference. And in addition to metal screws, uh, some people were using nylon, uh, like tent pole type, arrangements to replace the nails but once again this was leaving a nylon and fiberglass plug in the uh, body of the mm. tree so i've gone back to ancient building techniques and doing a couple of tests on using wooden pegs inserted into uh, drilled. sterilized drilled holes into the side of trees uh, when i went to climb up to check whether the tree had sealed around the wooden peg that the nest box was hanging on unfortunately uh, possums poked their heads out of the test nest boxes so so far I haven't actually been able to get up to lift the nest boxes off to check how uh, well the tree has sealed around the uh, wooden peg but the boxes have been hanging up there for six months quite happily. Okay look uh, I think we have to leave the questions there back to you Annie to um, say a final thank you. And I undertake to um, get all those questions, send them to Susan and Courtney, and we will get you answers. And they're all fabulous questions. So thank you. They're, they're the best answer, uh, questions that we've seen throughout Science Week, uh, very comprehensive. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, look, thank you to Courtney and Susan and, and Andrew at the end there for a very rich presentation and very stimulating as well. I think we're going to see the demand for next box, nest boxes go through the, the roof in, the, in a short time. I think there are some pretty obvious connections too with uh, the work that's happening on gang gangs, both in the ACT and the project that's happening down here. So it'd be really good if we can link those up, you know, at some point along the way. Um, all right. So thank you again, Susan and Courtney in particular. And um, thank you everybody for attending. Bye for now. Um, thanks, Annie. And look, um, for those people, when you leave the meeting when it ends, you should be taken to a screen with an evaluation survey. And we're really encouraging people to um, 
to uh, fill those out because the data is really valuable. And look, just as a closing thing, I just wanted to show you that screen there, which is um, kids at Bermagui, um Public School last year. Ross Fackerel, who uh, used to be a casual teacher here at Bonda, he ran a uh, workshop with the kids. And Ross, he spent half the night before putting all these flat packs together so the kids didn't have to cut anything but they glued and they screwed and nailed and hammered with great vigor and uh, they were kindy kids and they absolutely loved it and one of the nicest things about it was um, Ross had uh, put uh, got the kids to sign their names on the inside of the uh, box so he said that when the birds or the animals came up the ladder and stuck their head in the box so they'd see the kids' names and the kids' eyes were wide and they thought, that's awesome. So thank you, everyone. We're about to go and start the Echidna um, practice session before starting the Echidna CSI session at 2 uh, p.m. So if you want to hear about Echidnas, um, it's not too late to register and you'll get a link for that. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Annie. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Courtney. Thanks, Doug. And Bye.